Hello and good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome, welcome to the South Asian Digital Tribal Conversation. This is the second edition. Uh, this week, we have a dis distinguished panel uh, of speakers from Nepal, Bangladesh, Maldives, and the lovely country of Bhutan. So I quickly move on to uh, introducing our panels for the evening. We have from uh, Bangladesh, Mr. H.M. Hakim Ali. Mr. Hakim Ali is the Chief Executive Officer of the Hotel Agrabad in Chittagong, Bangladesh, and the winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Department of Tourism and Hospitality Management of Dhaka University for his role in tourism development and promotion in his country. Mr. Hakim Ali is also the president of the Bangladesh International Hotel Association and of South Asia Tourism Federation. We have uh, Mr. Sunil Sakya from Nepal. Mr. Sunil is the chairman of the KGH group of hotels and resorts. It is one of the oldest uh, hospitality chains uh, from the country. He is also the immediate past chairman of Pata uh, Nepal chapter and presently remains in the executive committee as well. He is also the president of Nepal USA Chamber of Commerce and Industry and is a special member in its executive committee. Uh, we have Mr. Abdullah Ghias from the Maldives. Mr. Abdullah was voted as Pata Face of the Future 2018 and is the VP of the Maldives Association of Travel Agents and Tour Operators. He is also the deputy of the Consulate of Republic of Seychelles to the Maldives. Mr. Abdullah is a serial entrepreneur in leading travel and startup businesses such as Inna Maldives, Ace Travels Maldives, Pence Maldives, and so on. He has also been recognized as the ICI Maldives as one of the outstanding young persons in the Maldives for his role in business turnaround. Last but not least, we have Ms. Sangeeta Rana. She is the Executive Director of the Hotels and Restaurants Association of Bhutan. She has several years of experience in the travel and tourism industry. She is also the board member of various tourism and private sector development boards, such as the TDB, CTA, BSTS, HRDB, etc. She represents the exotic country of Bhutan. So welcome to all our panelists. Let's hope we have a wonderful uh, round of discussions carrying forward from uh, last week. So my first question would be to Mr. Hakim. Uh, so you have been known as the mastermind uh, of uh, Bangladesh tourism and its promotion. And uh, uh, especially in the hospitality sector, so we have predicted that uh, you know the overall Bangladeshi tourism sector will incur a loss of approximately around nine thousand seven hundred and five crore taka, which is a huge amount and a major you know uh, hit the industry is taking. So Bangladesh being such an emerging market in the South Asian region, what do you think is your country's uh, you know, strategy for a rebound? Thank you. Good evening to all of you who are here from Bhutan, Nepal, and Maldives. And as I've been already introduced, I'm in this trade for over 50 years now. And I've been graduated from Cornell University a long time back. After that, I have started this business, tours and travel and hotel. The hotel I have in, in Chittagong is over 50 years now. And I'm the one in Bangladesh who has shown what is tourism and how to do this, uh, what do you call this tourism business and tour operating. So this, that is a long history. So in this now we are in a cyclone, what we call as a, what do you call as a uh, coronavirus, what we are having, you know, Bangladesh is in a mess, especially I'm the president of Bangladesh International Hotel Association, 
I have 51 hotels and I deal with all two, three, four, five stars. So, but there are another association, they are known as a hotel association and restaurant association. They are dealing with other hotels, all normal hotels, guest houses and others. But I deal with the stars hotel. The star hotels, the report I have, you know, we made a, we had a meeting last week and uh, we just worked out, you know, till June, you know, our estimated loss will be about 1,500, uh, uh, 1500 crore. And if it goes to December, it will be over 3,000 crore. But overall, whatever uh, Pata gave the figure, it will be much more, uh, uh, the Pata's figure is not less, it will be much more what we are thinking. Because I'm sure you are seeing in the TV and your WHO reports that this, this coronavirus till today, we have only 7,000 people, as about 8,000 people are only affected. But, you know, we do not have much uh, testing equipment. And I don't know if, they, if you do the lot of other testing, how many will come up. But I always pray to Almighty Allah that let it be under control. But, you know, we have a huge population uh, like uh, other countries, you know, too much. Our population, officially we say, 1700 but it is much more than that you know so whatever it is the tourism business will, will take time i don't think so in 2020 nothing can be done maybe the smaller hotels who are doing the local business they can do something provided these coronavirus and other things are under control thank you Uh, Mr. Sunil, yeah. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, you know um, Nepal tourism was targeted in twenty twenty as the visit Nepal year, and there were a lot of uh, planning that was going on to attract about two million visitors. Uh, you know, hitting uh, the, the globe. Uh, where where does Nepal stand in this regard? And like, uh, it's a massive, massive hit. Uh, for all the planning and uh, you know uh, those strategies that was built around uh, Nepal visit uh, visit Nepal 2020. So where do you think this puts the nation of Nepal in terms of the travel and tourism industry? Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Suresh, uh, for and and uh, my greetings from uh, Kathmandu to all of you. Uh, uh, this is the first time I'm uh, attending this seminar uh, in South Asia. Uh, digital travel conversation. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, greetings once again to all my colleagues. Uh, yes, uh, Nepal, uh, we announced this ambitious plan of Visit Nepal 2020. We, uh, on the 1st of Jan, we actually launched this program, but we have to withdraw because of the corona. Um, I wouldn't say it is a humanita humanitarian catastrophe at this moment because in Nepal, uh, we haven't had a single death so far, but we've had 59 confirmed cases and we are taking a precautionary approach. Um, the cancellation of uh, the VNY 2020 was, uh, it was an essential decision that the government had to make um, because of uh, we were not prepared. Nobody in the world is prepared for this. Uh, so we are, uh, it, it's something that we have not been able to understand. I think we are still in the verge of not being able to understand this disease, um, this virus. Um, so we are still, uh, the whole world is, it's, we are, it's still a, a very, very unfolding uh, phase. There is a social tsunami, there is an economic tsunami. We don't, we can't even look into the numbers as yet because we don't know. Uh, they are saying that the second and the third wave is coming. We don't know how this is going to affect especially in India, uh, they are taking a precautionary approach. And we have been lucky in the Himalayan region as such, like Bhutan and Sikkim and uh, all, the, all the mountain regions so far, uh, it's still, the numbers are still within contained and deaths have not been reported, but we are still very, very wary. As um, our, uh, the infrastructure for health like hospitals are not up to the mark, uh, uh, may not be able to 
uh, we are not we may not be able to sort of meet those um, meet those numbers if that peaks. So we have to take the precautionary approach and um, the herd immunity and all the other aspect. We have to be we don't have we are not prepared as such. The rapid tests and uh, these tests haven't come. So therefore, our numbers, the numbers that we get from the government, I don't think we can really 100% rely on that yet. The only numbers that we can rely is the number of deaths. These, the other numbers can be suppressed as we, uh, the, the rapid tests haven't really come into real effect. It is coming. Uh, so, you know, it is a so, sort of a humanitarian and a social, um, uh, catastrophe at the moment. We are looking at that. I mean, it is amazing. Uh, but uh, miraculously in Nepal, the numbers haven't really come to that, but we are very, uh, very uh, wary. The tourism is uh, absolutely uh, uh, come down. There is no activity as such. Not only tourism, the, 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 the education, the whole uh, business is down. Um, uh, it's a standstill lockdown for 45 days. Uh, flights, uh, international flights, domestic flights, all have come down. Transportation, all is no more. So um, uh, a lot of tourists that were here, about 10, 20,000 of the tourists have been flown back. We still have about 10,000 tourists still in Nepal, which um, a lot of uh, flights are there. Yeah, that they are being uh, sort of on the relief that is being taken out. Uh, a lot of Nepalese, there's a 4.5 million Nepalese right now. Um, the youths that have been working outside are desperately wanting to come back now. And that is another social uh, problem. Uh, and we have to now, Nepal government has to start finding some sort of a, absorb these people, young people in terms of jobs and employment and how we're going to feed, feed them is going to be another question, another uh, challenge for us. So we are in the middle of a big, big challenge. We don't have the answers at the moment, but uh, we are going from day to day. The government is coming on the relief uh, to the people to feed these people. The, the business are coming, the small business um, individuals are coming in a, in a smaller way, but, but we need to do a much, much more here. Um, this, uh, uh, so I think I'll take up the other questions also, but uh, I think two or three minutes, so I want to just contain myself. So uh, in terms of the economic numbers, like Pata has given some numbers, I think uh, we are like um, my previous, uh, uh, Mr. Hakim Ali had just mentioned, it's going to be much, much more than that. The economic fallout, the social fallout is going to be much, much more than that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hakim. Uh Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sunil. Uh, yes. This uh, next question is for Ms. Sankita. Yeah. So uh, we all know uh, 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 Bhutan tourism and uh, you know how prevalent tourism is practiced in uh, Bhutan is slightly different from the rest of the uh, other nations in the South Asian region, uh, where Bhutan is very specific about the number of tourists that enter the country and all that stuff. With, uh, in normal times, you have a very strict uh, you know, uh, process of accepting tourists. Under the given circumstances, uh, you know, that has become like, even that has like come to a standstill. Uh, we understand that Bhutan has a very less number of uh, uh, COVID uh, cases, but still the country is also taking all the precautions necessary. So going forward, uh, when you're working with such small numbers uh, and, uh, you know, the government is very keen on like keeping it that way, what do you think is the uh, way forward for Bhutan tourism and how, how do you expect to rebound from this current situ situation that we are in right now? What do you think the government should be doing or rather what is the industry in Bhutan thinking are the steps that uh, we have to take to you know, rebound uh, uh, the business back into how it worked before? Yeah. Thank you, Suraj. Thank you, Suraj. Uh, greetings from Bhutan. And uh, I would like to thank the whole team of Tata for this opportunity. 
But uh, first of all, uh, as you have talked about our tourism policy, so let me just uh, give a brief about our tourism policy. So our tourism policy started, uh, our tourism started in 1974. Uh, and since then, the ro Royal Government of Bhutan has pursued this uh, policy of high value and low volume approach to tourism. So, uh, and uh, since the beginning, Bhutan has uh, actively pursued and successfully implemented this policy also. And we have an all inclusive tariff system, but uh, uh, that is to ensure uh, all inclusive tourism policy means that uh, we have, it's a guided tour. Can you? Sorry, Suraj. Can you hear me? Yeah, hello. It's uh, it's okay. Uh, I think we lost you in okay. between. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, we on the technical list. Okay. Can you just uh, you know come back again uh, with what you were saying? Okay, okay. Sorry. So, uh, anyways, I was just talking about the policy and our tariff system. So, this system is uh, because of our uh, limited carrying cap capacity and uh, both in terms of human resource and also infrastructure in our country. And uh, especially during this time of COVID-19, I feel that our policy uh, of high value and low volume will be successful because we do not have mass tourism in the country. So uh, this could be a positive thing for our country at, the, at this time. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we are uh, concerned about the safety and security of the tourists as well. Uh, you know, uh, we believe that guests are gods. So we want to uh, give them the utmost respect and also give them the uh, best experience when they are in our country. So, uh, but at the same time, um, this has hit the hotel industry really hard. Uh, like every other country in the world, Bhutan is uh, no exception in this uh, COVID-19 situation. And uh, we agree that we need to evolve and we need to have a more dynamic and uh, you know, broad tourism policy at this time. So still, the guiding theme will uh, definitely be high value, low volume tourism policy, but that uh, uh, does not necessarily mean that uh, we are talking about less number of tourists. But uh, I think at this time, during this uh, situation in COVID-19, um, we are looking at, uh, uh, you know, but this also entirely depends on our neighbors because Bhutan is a small landlocked country and the situation in the neighboring states and the neighboring country uh, is Bhutan really depends on the neighbors. So uh, when we talk about domestic tourism, Bhutan is a very small country with a very small population. So we really cannot depend on the domestic tourism or staycations as uh, other countries like India or China can do that. But for Bhutan, I think that'll be really a challenge. Uh, on the policy part, I believe uh, our uh, high value, low volume policy, uh, I think it's not the policy to be blamed, but instead uh, it's the seasonality issue in our country. Because uh, from day one, Bhutan has been portrayed as a seasonal destination. So uh, our peak season starts from March to June and from September to December, and the rest of the months are lean season. So I think that is a mindset that we need to change because Bhutan doesn't have an extreme uh, weather. So uh, we can travel to Bhutan any time of the year. Uh, but at the same time, Bhutan is uh, uh, equally affected as the rest of the world. So um, we are looking at the safety and security of the locals and also the entire world. So. Uh, at the moment, we feel for the hotels and the tourism industry to bounce back. It will take at least a year to totally bounce back. So uh, safety and security is really important for Bhutan. So for now, uh, we are looking at becoming self-sufficient, more of becoming self-sufficient 
and uh, with India going into lockdown further, you know, it's really going to affect the tourism industry in our country. So uh, I think, uh, especially for the Bhutan's uh, tourism industry, we have been so uh, hit so hard. Uh, I think every hotelier is going through a rough time, going through a sleepless night, you know, so, um, uh, but as a nation, we are definitely working together and uh, planning to work and, and uh, hopefully the situation improves. And Okay, uh, so thank you, Sangeeta. Uh, that was some really good insights uh, uh, from Bhutan. Uh, now I'll just move on to uh, Mr. Abdullah. Uh, uh, Abdullah, like uh, in the first half of 2020, uh, you know, we uh, like a country like Maldives uh, had a huge influx of Chinese tourists. And this year, uh, uh, once the COVID has, uh, you know, uh, hit the world, we see a massive drop in that as well. So that's like, uh, I think in the tune of 87 million Chinese tourists are not expected to fly. And this means a major hit for aviation industry, more like a uh, you know, V-shaped v decline. And let the, uh, uh, let's not talk about the aviation industry right now, but specifically to the Maldives, a country which uh, depends so much on, uh, you know, the, the major chunk of the tourism coming from the Chinese market. Uh, what do you think, uh, you know, uh, is uh, Maldives, uh, how is Maldives going to handle the situation? And uh, you know, what do you think is the way industry should gear up for this? Thank you, Suraj. Uh, firstly, warm welcome to Maldives. Assalamu alaikum. And without a doubt, uh, China is the largest source market for Maldives as of 2019 with about 16.7% uh, uh, of the market share. And within a month, we went from a Chinese market problem uh, to a global shutdown, as everyone is aware. And today, there's more cases outside China than of inside. And China is also, in terms of affected cases, well behind um, US, Spain, Italy, UK, France, Germany, Turkey, Russia, Iran, and Brazil. And travel restrictions have been imposed in over 180 countries, which is a vast majority of the travel demand. So this is truly a global problem and uh, rightly declared by uh, UNWTO as a, uh, I mean, WHO as a global pandemic. So how does this translate to Maldives, a country that depends um, or, is, or does has one of the world's highest GDP dependency on tourism. Indirectly or directly, about 80% of tourism, 80% uh, of the GDP depends on tourism. And the way our economy has been suffering in the last month and a half, I think the dependency might be even higher. This is certainly a serious problem, well beyond anyone can imagine. We are already seeing serious uh, liquidity problem among SMEs and even large enterprises. And I don't think many businesses will be able to sustain without serious government intervention, as this is a moment of survival. And coming back to China and airlines, start of the year, we had about 45 million seat capacity for worldwide travel. And now that's less than 5 million. And IATA says that 85% um, of the world's airlines worldwide might go bankrupt if they are not bailed out. As for China, China are by nature a very risk averse population. The present surge in domestic travel after the lifting of the restrictions may actually not reflect um, their need to travel, but I think they are returning back home uh, to their home cities. But without a doubt, there is recovery there, and we might even see uh, a V-shaped recovery now, as a lot of people use that word, in terms of, uh, of manufacturing, which is already happening there. And when China is ready to travel, I'm sure more this will be among their top priority if we start working with the major tour operators in China, the airlines from China, and most importantly, better bilateral relationship. Thank you. When, uh... Yeah, uh, just to continue from where you just talked now, uh, I, I would like to also ask you like, 
when the market is ready and when uh, you know we see chinese tourists coming in uh, what would uh, you know how would the maldivian industry uh, you know gear itself to face that uh, you know the arrival of those tourists uh, what do you think the industry would be uh, you know planning and strategizing to receive them i think there is already uh, a lot of discussion when it comes to this um it is also not uh, just a discussion uh, that is happening in the in maldives but around the world a um, lot of debate uh, back and forth uh, when is the right time to open it um i think our finance minister a few uh, last week put out five scenarios and said that we might have a likely scenario of scenario 3 where uh we were looking at opening uh, our borders by july uh there is a bo- of course a heated debate back and forth on that and uh coming back to how the airlines and the whole world is uh, is is uh, hoping with this people are talking about health passports people are talking about empty uh middle seats and has screening rapid testing on arrival and departures social and physical distancing at airports and even inside flights but what's interesting is yesterday we saw um, the ceo of hathro airport uh, one of the biggest hubs in the world saying that social distancing on airports and aircrafts is impossible so there is still a lot of Uh, back and forth about this and even who i think uh, last week warned that um, against coronavirus immunity passports or risk free certificates so i think things are still unfolding and uh, it might be a bit premature uh, to say which direction we are going but um, as you know more this is presently moving towards peak and uh, the, the the biggest priority right now is the safety of our people and i think the doctors and the health authorities are doing a very good job in terms of how we're coping with given the limited uh, resources as a small country like maldives has uh, so um, even mnprc i think two weeks ago had uh, or a week ago had a webinar and uh, there is definitely a dialogue and we're hoping that uh, and we're being very optimistic that uh, we will be ready once uh, the recovery is ready like uh in the situation that we right now where we can't yeah in the situation that we fa- uh, you know find ourselves in where most of the countries are shut down locked under lockdown where the uh, travel industry especially especially the hospitality sector you know can't welcome their guests and uh, uh you know uh, do any kind of marketing uh, directly uh host events and things like that So going forward uh like what would be the strategies that you know hospitality industry which is specific to the hospitality industry that you would see you know emerging because it is very critical that uh, you know hotels have to strategize a comeback and it's not going to be the same scenario like they were operating now so it's going to be new so what do you think uh you know would be uh, the kind of strategies that you think the hospitality industry would be adapting uh, to overcome this issue when things start to like you know trickle in as business uh, business is open up markets open up so what do you think the strategies that will help uh, the hospitality industry and especially uh, you know it, it requires people to innovate uh, try out something new to survive uh, once this uh, thing start to move towards uh, normalcy so uh, i would like to uh, you know hear your thoughts on that Ah uh, Suraj is this a question who is this addressed to Yeah this was addressed to Mr Hakim Okay Hello yeah Mr Hakim uh, did you get my question Yeah yeah I got your question everything okay but can you hear me Yeah yeah loud and clear please so, you know just uh, before me Mr Abdullah was uh, online and uh, he was telling about this airline you know so you know for this tourism business the airlines plays a very important role and here as it said that i had already said that about 75% of these uh, airline companies might get bankrupt 
And like my airline, like Bangladesh Biman, they're already in a very big, in a thick soup. They don't know what to do. And we don't have a very big fleet like uh, your, uh, other countries. But other airlines, like we, we don't, in Bangladesh, not many airlines are coming, but uh, those who are coming like Singapore Airlines, like Emirates and all, and they, unless and until they come back to Dhaka, means our, any of our destination, especially the hotels, they cannot come back anymore. Uh, they cannot come back. So the most important, like in our country now, all the hotels, they are doing disinfection. They are taking a lot of measures The how can be sanitized, how the guests will be protected. A lot of programs are going on. A lot of trainings are on, and our government is also supporting. Government is also giving a giving a loan to the hospitality industry at a very low interest. So we are getting a lot of support. But unless and until the people doesn't come from outside, you know, then we cannot come up. So the only thing is, it's not me. It's like uh, Mr. Abdullah said about China. Same in my country. Maximum people are coming into Bangladesh is from China. Then then our second country is India. So if this China and India, it doesn't come to shape, it will be very difficult for us to come up, you know. So we are all praying to Almighty Allah that uh, if things come normal, only then this hospitality industry can survive. Otherwise, very difficult. This morning, <clears throat> we had, I had a small meeting with some of my friends and they said, tell us what to do because they are being locked down for last. They have been locked down from March. So March gone, April gone, now the May has come. So how to pay the salary, how to pay the utility bill? Can you expedite the government to give us uh, the loan that they want to give us? So how far it can go? Because you know, Bangladesh is a poor country and uh, maximum people who are employed, they do not get that much big salary that other developing countries do get. So they, these employees also can sustain for holiday one to two months. Now we are also in a thick soup. I don't know what's going to happen and we are trying how we can overcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Suraj. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hakim. Uh, Mr. Sunil. Like uh, we have, uh, you know, we we are hearing about uh, some potential markets, uh, like countries like Germany, uh, uh, Italy, uh, Spain. Like though they are undergoing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, issues with the pandemic, but they also, you know, very positive about you know things moving forward and like you know willing to open up their markets and talking about uh, people traveling out. So these uh, like uh, countries like Norway, that we. Sweden. So we have some kind of a positive, uh, you know, uh, news that's coming out. Like these countries might open up travel, uh, you know, uh, in the first level of uh, when things start to move. So what would be your outreach uh, strategy as a thought leader for such kind of? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Suraj. Uh, uh, first of all. Um, uh, I mean, we have to open up at one time or the other. I mean, we can't afford to really close down forever. Uh, but uh, the strategy uh, right now for us, for at least 2020 is us to survive. I don't think we can really make plans or dreams. I think they'll have to sort of work a bit later. If we can just survive 2020 uh, with cut down, with uh, pay cuts, with uh, job cuts, with austerity measures, uh, Everybody taking that and the government coming with uh, the stimulus packages have to have happen for us to survive this year for 2020. Um, Nepal is a landlocked country. Everything is flown in um, uh, and um, we depend uh, largely on, Nep uh, on India and China, uh, like my colleague um, uh, Hakim has said. Uh, we, I mean, there are so many things uh, that we have to depend on right now. But right now, I think for this particular immediately, immediate future for the next three to six months is us to be able to survive. However, I mean, uh, the, some of the European uh, countries are slowly opening up. They are going towards the herd immunity, uh, the, the survival of the fittest. And uh, I think that is something that we will also will have to follow sometime in the future because we just can't afford to close down all the time. Some partial opening up and with uh, 
maybe with the health uh, passports like uh, uh, Abdullah has mentioned, um, these quarantine and if we can do that, uh, we can hope that people will want to travel. I've just made some points. Uh, so I'm just going to make a point and try to be precise. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to look at, uh, just become very on, on, on bullet points. Yeah, first sure, of all, sure. yeah, is first of all, listen to the markets. Uh, uh, the markets uh, for us uh, at the moment is the, the European markets, if they are opening up and if they are with the compliance, with uh, WHO compliance, with the health compliances, we'll have to listen to the market. Use all the listening points. We have to listen and the new changes that are coming. This is one of the listening posts, but not the strongest one. We really have to listen to that. To that. Number two, rethink where, uh, where Nepal should take the tourism. Uh, this is a reset and also a great pause. So Nepal needs to respect that and not rely on the knee-jerk uh, mechanism of recovery. Uh, third is uh, all the indications that mass travel is out for a while. We're going to probably have to look uh, Sagita in the Bhutan strategy. Um, I think, uh, uh, which is great. Uh, uh, we can generally concentrate on more sustainable travel and create um, rewards and mechanism, uh, mechanisms for these practitioners. Not everyone appreci appreciates sustainable travel as much as it's talked about. Um, on, uh, maybe on the next point is really work on the hygiene. That's going to be a big task for all of us. And Nepal is, is uh, not, well, we, are, we have to work on it. We need to upgrade big time. Uh, this opportunity for that is to happen. Fail on that front, we can forget about all the goals. Uh, do it right, and we may come out of it as winners. Number five, travel is going to be more of a luxury and more expensive, I think. Uh, accordingly, um, we should, uh, the experience which um, are, uh, uh, we, we have to concentrate on the real value of the money experience now. We really have to concentrate on that. Number six, do not stop messaging, but, but the right one, according to the uh, concerted plans, uh, no knee jerks. We, we really have to become very precise on the plans. Number seven, prepare the country for the rebound uh, all across the value chain. So these are some of the things that we need to work on. Uh, yeah, so when we get out of this, we need to compete with countries with higher budgets to come to bring back the tourism and, uh, and stronger uh, focus campaigns, some of which messaging has already started. We need to stand out, not because of how much we spend, but because what we have, uh, because of, and we really need to fine tune the experience uh, of the holidays. So these are some of the points that I have made, just jotted down, and uh, I hope it, it helps. Uh, but we have a long way to go. And, uh, but th the message is this year immediately, we need to survive. Um, this six months for the year uh, 2020 is on survival and revival will be on 2021. I look at it at a two year, two year um, plan of action. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, okay, uh, Sangeeta, uh, like carrying uh, on from what uh, uh, Suni just said, being a hotelier yourself in Bhutan, like how long do you think a hotel in a small destination like Bhutan can survive? Uh, and if at all, uh, you know, what would be the kind of strategies that you would, you know, apply going forward to like post the lockdown time to generate the kind of business that can sustain your, uh, you know, uh, your industry? Thank you, Suraj. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. And I agree to Mr. Shakya also. At the moment, tourism industry is totally shut down. So there are about uh, 800 hotels in Bhutan, which employs over 50,000 people directly. So this has been, uh, of course, turbulent times for Bhutan and the entire world. Uh, at the max, I would say hotels could survive for a maximum of three to six months because the running costs are huge. And uh, Bhutan is moving through it, of course, but uh, and working uh, together, uh, like I mentioned earlier, 
but with over 3 million people infected globally, COVID-19 has severely affected the travel industry around the world, including Bhutan. So uh, even though the travel restrictions on tourists began in early March uh, in Bhutan, the virus had already slowed down and impacted our tourism industry from the month of February itself. As the situation worsens globally, the travel, uh, because, you know, uh, like I said, uh, ours is a landlocked country. So as the situation worsens uh, globally, uh, the travel restriction in our country may continue indefinitely. So it's like very unsure of what's going to happen. So, uh, so we are anticipating for the worst, actually, uh, at the present moment. Uh, even after, after the outbreak is over, it could take up to 10 months for the travel industry to recover completely. And uh, similar to the world, uh, in Bhutan also, uh, our industry has been hit the hardest. Majority of the hotels completely depend on tourists. So the current situation is really bad with no cash flow at all for the hotel industry. So a very small percentage of business is coming from the domestic market uh, because we do not uh, have a large population. And like even the domestic uh, tourism is, uh, has dropped to nil at the moment. And, uh, uh, but we are, you know, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the hotels have very high operational cost. And uh, uh, so definitely we are plummeting towards a crash at this moment. But luckily, uh, upon a royal command uh, from our king, uh, our loans has been deferred for a period of three months and uh, with a waiver on interest payment for loans from April to June 2020. And we have also been provided with uh, working capitals at 5% interest. So this is especially to uh, get the hotel going and you know, pay our staffs uh, so that we don't uh, lay off our staffs. And the other point is uh, our government has also been supporting us as uh, they have been using our hotels as quarantine centers. So this has been a big help for the hotel industry. So uh, though not all the hotels has been used as quarantine users, uh, uh, are coming back to Bhutan. So they have to stay in quarantine for a compulsory period of 21 days. So, but uh, with India going into lockdown, uh, we have, uh, this has been a disastrous, uh, this has had disastrous impact on Bhutan. Um, and I think this will take a long time for the tourism industry to revive and come back to normalcy. So at the moment, uh, we really hope for the best and <laughs> we pray for the best, Suraj, what to do now. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Abdullah, like uh, last year, around the same time, you were attending the Asian Business Aviation Conference and Exhibition in Shanghai, right? Uh, this year, here we are sitting and doing a, uh, you know, uh, online digital conversation uh, and clearly with no, uh, no clue as to like how we can actually attend these kind of events and like, you know, conduct business the way we used to know. So in this scenario, uh, uh, where do you think, uh, you know, uh, the aviation industry stands and like, you know, what are the real challenges that we are going to face in the coming days, uh, you know, go, uh, once again, hopefully when things start to like slowly trickle in, people start to like slowly travel, markets opening up. So until then, uh, uh, this industry is like, along with the travel industry, which we are very uh, interlinked, uh, has also taken a major beating. And, uh, you know, what do you think, uh, you know, the industry uh, would be uh, facing as in the coming days? Yeah, so basically business aviation is the private jets industry uh, or called general aviation. Um, and that was the trade show that I was in. Uh, so from the aviation sector, just focusing on um, that, 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 that niche. And um, I think uh, last month, uh, 
NBAA, National Business Aviation Association in US, which is one of the world's largest association that represents uh, the major jet operators and aircraft manufacturers in a letter to the US Senate uh, said that, that they employ about 1.2 million people and airplane billing of about 247 million US dollars. That is about 28% of the total aviation industry. But this market, that niche of private jet industry that Maldives is, Maldives is um, attractive to, is actually a very resilient uh, industry. Uh, when this crisis started in other regions in February and in March, we saw current countries like in US and in Europe, um, there was over 30% surge, surge in demand uh, for people eager to fly back home and avoid commercial flights. Even in the Maldives last month, there were still people wanting to come and fly in for Easter holidays or avoid other more severely affected countries. We even saw luxury hoteliers in Maldives advocating for this. Whether it is the right thing to do or not is a whole different uh, debate. But what I see is this market will bounce back faster than the mid-range or budget travelers. Their disposable income of this market is obviously far, far greater uh, for someone who can afford a, a Gulfstream. But their main concern is safety. And we can, if, if Maldives can assure that, I think then definitely uh, recovery in that segment can come to us faster. Uh, it was interesting just uh, today I saw uh, an article a friend shared on Daily Mail that one of the most popular holiday destinations for Zoom backgrounds, now that we are on a Zoom call, uh, Maldives was number two. So people are definitely dreaming and the appetite for Maldives is there across all segments. And I like to be an optimist that all segments will recover, obviously in time, but given that we take the right actions at the right times. Thank you. Thank you. That was quite in, uh, you know, very positive indeed. Uh, coming to Mr. Uh, uh, Hakeem, uh, I'd like to have a small question thrown at you, uh, which may sound a bit drastic, but then, you know, uh, or apprehensive, but then it is a question that, you know, it's on a lot of people's mind. Like, under the given circumstances, uh, you know, do you foresee any kind of sectors, segments shutting down in uh, for perpetuity? Like, you know, you know, things they cannot like now sustain or survive through this and going forward with, there'll be a lot of uh, pressure for hygiene, safety, uh, you know, put in a lot of investment to take care of all of these aspects. And there are certain segments or sectors of the market that cannot, uh, you know, take on such kind of an investment, which will be a huge financial burden on their operation. Uh, so do you see any sector in the travel and hospitality segment of, you know, likely to face such a scenario. Thank you, Mr. Suraj. You know, just uh, Mr. Sunil from Nepal, what he said, you know, we are also in the same state like Nepal, you know, and like our hotels who are now in like uh, intercontinental uh, Pacific or uh, La Meridian, all the chain hotels, they will do it. But if you think of the normal hotels, local hotels, you know, for them it will be quite tough, you know. But as um, Mr. Sunil said, that it will be more, ex the, the, the package will be more expensive, you know. So I got, I mean, Bangladesh is, a, is not a very big market for the incoming tourists because we have a lot of development work is going on rather than tourists, you know. Our tourist rate is not very much compared to Bhutan, Nepal, or uh, India or whatever the neighboring countries we have. But we have a lot of development work going on. So thousands of people are coming in for business and it is an upcoming investment is going on. So on that effect, the, the, uh, these chain hotels will cover up, but I doubt for the uh, local hotels and the other local uh, operators to run the hotel is very difficult. The private owners we have, they have they, they, they don't go the chain, but for them tough as we, they hardly can sustain for another two, three months. And if the government comes up with a low interest rate, we ask for some uh, grants. And if they, give, if they give us some grant, it is okay. Otherwise, for the other people who are doing a small hotel business, they will be tough. But for the chain hotel is no problem. 
like as I said in my previous uh, question, that uh, we still in the hotel in Bangladesh, they could not pay the salary of March. Now the April is also going by. So the government has said that they are going to give the salary, but we are waiting that how long they will be giving. They made a system that the salary will not be given to the owners. The salary will go directly to the employers. With, we will give them the national ID and other uh, mechanism. They will send the money. So this process is going on. But to survive this industry, especially it will take long time as uh, Bhutan or uh, your Malt, our Nepalese friend has said. But this year we'll have to forget, we wait for next year. Thank you, Mr. Suraj. And I'd just like to add one thing more, that I have five minutes left for me to go for iftar, you know. So I thank all of you to be with me and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hakim, for being part of it. Uh, a quick question to Mr. Sunil. See, uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we understand that like uh, amongst the sectors that could open up once things uh, start to normalize, one of the sectors that people think might open up is the business trap. Uh, you know, you need to get there, get out and do your business. So it might see a, a possible, uh, you know, uh, revival out of uh, various sectors in the hospitality industry. So, uh, you know, how, but then we also uh, technology to now connect and conduct business. So in this scenario and the post uh, COVID scenario, where do you think business travel would be and how would the shape of things to, uh, th shape of things to come in terms of business travel? Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Sunil, uh, I think you're on uh, mute. Okay, I think, uh, okay, I'm sorry about it. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Suraj. Um, I think uh, the business travel will still go on, um, but it'll take a little bit of a backseat uh, because of uh, uh, trying to, come, uh, you know, um, we have to comply with the social distancing and physical distancing. Uh, as long as this uh, coronavirus vaccine, uh, Will not come. I, I think this this is going to this is going to we are, it's not going to be a normal situation. And uh, uh, but I think um, uh, like we have to embrace the technology, the technology technology of uh, the digital technology, um, the AI, the artificial intelligence, facial rec recognition. This is where the airports, the airlines will have to adopt this as 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 fast as possible. In terms of hotels, in terms of check-ins, these things, uh, room service, I think we are going to the new normal now. Um, we are coming to the new era, the new world, the new, everything is new. So we have to also adopt to this and go back. Um, however, I think uh, uh, in terms of nature, like uh, wellness tourism, nature-based tourism, spiritual, these things, these will, I think, will become more appealing to the people uh, in that way. Um, we really need to sort of rethink on the tourism paradigm. Why tourism? Uh, what tourism? How tourism? How, how, how we inspire? These are some of the points that we really will have to look into. I think uh, uh, we really have to really focus on the new standards of health um, and the sta standardization services. Um, this is where we'll have to focus on um, the business coming back to your question, the business will be there, but on a smaller numbers, I don't think we can really look into the huge numbers of Congress and AGMs in these huge numbers. We'll have to look, sort of see how uh, it is being happening in the White House. These kind of numbers, uh, manageable numbers of 15, 20, 25. These are the kind of numbers, uh, meetings, with digital platforms. Uh, this is how we're going to be conducting our business till the vaccine comes. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, quickly, uh, uh, we have a few minutes left, but then I have time just uh, for some questions for Abdullah and Sagita. 
तो यू नो लाइक इन द सिनेरियो लाइक वंस वंस वी ओपन अप पोस्ट कोविड यू नो द द डिमांड डिमांड्स ऑफ आवर क्लाइंट्स एंड कस्टमर्स कुड बी लाइक अ डिफरेंट बॉल गेम ऑल टुगेदर यू नो कंसर्न्स ऑफ हाइजीन टू यू नो मेडिकल व्हाट यू कॉल इट मेडिकल रिस्पांस एंड आल्सो इंश्योरेंस like you know travel insurance and everything it's going to see a sea of change you know the way the customers priorities change in this regard so uh, what are your thoughts on that what do you see uh, you know possibly affect the industry in this way yeah suraj uh, um, that's a very interesting question perhaps it might be a bit too early to talk about how this can impact pricing and who will bear it Uh, but i know for sure or we know for sure that there is going to be a price implication and uh, now in terms of what you asked about return policies um uh, you know refund or cancellations i mean moldives has uh, in the context of moldives enjoyed uh, um, stricter policies uh, compared to other competing destinations even some high end resorts uh, you know putting up policies like 45 days to 60 days Uh, cancellations but if we are going to uh, compete then we will have to adopt and i think these changes have to come and like the other gentlemen uh, said in this um the the travel pool is going to be very limited especially this year uh, so uh, in order to compete for that we will have to have to be different um, you know people like apta from the uk is saying that major reforms have to come into reform uh, into into policies and into standards UNWTO and IIT is already working on new guidelines uh, you know a recovery plan but they're not been able to put this out uh, simply because it might be a bit premature given that the situation is changing uh, so so rapidly i'm sure the world will be a very different place when we come out of this um, you know people are calling a thing for new normal new way of life but there is a huge huge debate uh, destinations are already talking about incentivizing people to travel um subsidizing uh insurance providers are rethinking risks and uh, and premiums um but uh i i think in the coming weeks uh, we will be able to be able to understand this and further analysis has to be done uh, in order to talk about pricing uh post covid uh thank you that uh, and with the uh, li- uh, little time that we have at just about time to like uh, you know throw a question at sangeeta uh sangeeta like uh, we understand uh, bhutan has done really well in containing the pandemic uh, very few cases so does that mean that we can see bhutan uh, you know open up its uh, borders uh, or open up its markets for receiving uh, travelers much before the rest of the countries in south asia is that a possibility Thank you. Um, first of all, for Bhutan, uh, safety and security is extremely important. As of today, we have seventeen, uh, uh, not seventeen, seven positive cases of COVID nineteen in the country. So all the cases are imported, uh, and they are already in isolation wards at the moment. And luckily, there is no community transfer. So, uh, but. but uh, i think yesterday there was a rumor there was a case about a local man uh, being positive from our community but luckily it turned out that uh, he uh, the uh, test came out uh, negative so nonetheless we have to be careful and uh, we need to tread carefully and like i mentioned earlier our situation completely depends on our neighbors so even if bhutan uh, is safe and even if you want to open up to tourism but if our neighbors are are in a lockdown i think there's no way that we can uh, get tourists into our country so uh, for the moment uh, i think uh, safety would be our first priority because our king jinmi khetsa namgyal want you have been the light through this dark times for all of us you know he has provided a lot of relief for the bhutanese so uh, uh and as you all know our bhutan uh, our country is a gnh country 
and uh, we believe in gross national happiness of the country. And also when we bounce back, uh, we want to make sure that everything is safe and the, uh, the tourists feel safe to travel into the country. So for that, I, I think uh, we, there should be a mass uh, di disinfection process. All the touristic sites should be disinfected, even the hotels, so that uh, we build a trust between uh, uh, for the tourists so that they feel safe to travel here. And uh, I think our efforts, our king's effort, our prime minister's effort, and all the cabinet's, uh, cabinet minister's effort should not go, uh, you know, uh, uh, to waste. So we are working together to contain this pandemic and uh, we are unsure of the, what the future holds, but we definitely remain positive and uh, we hope and pray that even India, uh, you know, uh, 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 comes out of this lockdown soon so that uh, we benefit as well as uh, neighboring countries and all of South Asia together we can uh, we need to make sure that we fight this pandemic and yeah uh, yeah can thank you hear you. me sir? yeah okay thank okay you. <laughs> thank you and we are just uh, about uh, out of time here uh, thank you all of you for being a part of this uh, sata uh, digital conversation uh, wonderful uh, you know insights into uh, the industry from each country. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you, uh, Abdullah. Thank you, Sankita. Thank you, Mr. Hakeem. And thank you, Mr. Sunil, for being part of this uh, show. So, bye, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, we hope to see you next week. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.